Humankind has not returned to the moon for a long time. We have not conducted any manned flights to the moon since 1972, when the last manned space mission took place. Eugene Cernan was the last person to set foot on the moon in 1972. He went down in history as the 12th and, to date, last astronaut to walk on the moon's surface. Before seeking the answer to why humanity has not returned to the moon, we need to examine why we went there nearly 50 years ago with our low-tech spacecraft. By the way, before moving on to the video, I would be very happy if you liked it and subscribed to my channel. Your support for my channel is truly motivating as I bring you the latest developments in space exploration. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union Sputnik 1 satellite transmitted the first signal from space to Earth in human history. The beep beep signals from this tiny satellite changed everything forever because this was not just a satellite, it was a technological challenge from one of the victorious powers of World War II to the other. When the U.S. heard this signal, it panicked because it showed the technological level the Soviets had reached. There was more. If the Soviet Union could send a ballistic missile into space without a warhead, it could also send the same missile to the United States. In other words, the situation was extremely alarming. You know what happened next. In 1958, President Eisenhower established NASA. In 1961, Kennedy said, let's go to the moon. And a space race began in the shadow of the Cold War. In 1969, Neil Armstrong's small step became a giant leap for mankind. Five more manned moon missions followed. But then something happened, and after Apollo 17, manned moon missions were halted. I won't discuss fictional missions like Apollo 20, which are often mentioned in popular culture and brought up in conspiracy theories and fake videos. Instead, I'll explain why we didn't return to the moon in a logical manner. The Apollo 18, 19, and 20 missions were canceled due to increased costs, declining public and political interest, insufficient scientific data, and most importantly, budget constraints caused by the Vietnam War. Think about it. What we remember about the U.S. manned moon missions are the missions carried out with spacecraft that had low carrying capacity and limited capabilities, where flags were planted or some samples were collected. The total cost of the Apollo program is approximately $257 billion in today's money. Moreover, when the Soviets fell behind, in the moon race at that time, the competition also ended. The goal had been achieved for America. But now the picture has changed. Starting in the 2000s, China, India, and private companies began to enter the scene. China's collection of samples from the moon in 2020 and the successful landings on the moon's surface by Japan and India spurred America into action again. Because now it's not just about science. The moon has also become a strategic point militarily and economically. That is why NASA launched the Artemis program. The goal to send humans back by 2025 and then establish a permanent base on the moon's surface by 2030. So why are these bases being established? Just to plant a flag or to reanalyze rock samples? One of the most important reasons for China's interest in the moon is a rare isotope called helium-3. Helium-3 is an element with great potential for energy production through nuclear fusion. It is very scarce on Earth, but is thought to be abundant on the moon's surface. One ton of helium-3 can produce approximately 10 billion kilowatt hours of energy. This energy could meet about 7% of the annual electricity needs of the entire state. Of New York. I discuss this topic in detail in my video titled China's 2030 Vision to Colonize the Moon. If you like, you can watch that video after this one. Helium 3 on the moon is an extremely appealing isotope for both China and other countries. However, to sustain mining activities on the moon, you need to establish permanent bases. So, why is the amount of helium 3 on Earth so limited? 
because helium-3 from the sun is blocked by Earth's magnetic field. Since the moon has no magnetic field, helium-3 from the sun has accumulated on the moon's surface for billions of years. NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy are currently running a project called Fission Surface Power. The goal is to place a small nuclear reactor on the moon's surface capable of generating 40 kilowatts of power, enough electricity for about 30 homes. This reactor is designed to operate continuously for 10 years. The first nuclear reactor on the moon is expected to become operational before 2030. China and Russia are also developing similar projects. So, why nuclear energy instead of solar? A day on the moon, that is a day-night cycle, lasts 29.5 Earth days. This means 14 days of daylight followed by 14 days of darkness. Solar panels are insufficient during such long periods of darkness. The temperature difference is also extreme. Daytime temperatures reach plus 120 degrees Celsius, while nighttime temperatures drop to minus 130 degrees Celsius. Therefore, a constant and reliable energy source is needed. The solution, small modular nuclear reactors. But isn't nuclear energy dangerous? Yes, nuclear accidents can cause major disasters even on Earth. However, reactors on the moon will not be massive systems like those on Earth. They will be closed box reactors containing all the fuel inside and closed to external intervention. In fact, this technology will also be used in future missions to Mars. This is because solar energy is insufficient on Mars as well. In addition, the moon is strategically located for other missions to be carried out in the solar system. It is thought that there are millions of tons of water in the form of ice at the moon's south pole. This water can be used as drinking water and can also be separated into hydrogen and oxygen to produce rocket fuel. In other words, the moon could be a fuel station for Mars missions. Energy is also needed to extract water, produce oxygen, and even obtain building materials from the moon's soil. Solar energy does not have the capacity to handle such heavy tasks. Therefore, hydrogen energy can also be considered. The U.S. and other countries following the principle of in-situ resource utilization aim to use the moon's own resources instead of transporting everything from Earth. They plan to produce building materials from lunar soil, convert these materials into shelters using 3D printers, extract local water, generate energy there, and establish sustainable living areas. A rocket launch from the moon requires much less energy to reach distant planets like Mars than launches from Earth. The main reason for this is that the moon has one-sixth the gravity of Earth and virtually no atmosphere. Furthermore, Russia's new generation plasma rocket, which it claims to have developed in February 2025, could have up to 10 times higher specific impulse than conventional chemical rockets. With this technology, the journey time to Mars is predicted to drop from six to nine months to one to two months. Therefore, using the moon as a spaceport and combining it with advanced plasma rocket technology could open the door to much faster and more economical exploration of the solar system. I discuss this topic in detail in my video titled, Who Will Win the Mars Race? I recommend watching that video after watching this one. Putting all this together, the first countries to establish bases on the moon will have the best locations and will also have a say over the resources the moon offers. Certain high mountainous regions, especially at the South Pole, are exposed to sunlight for longer periods and are also close to water sources. This means that the first settlers on the moon will establish not only scientific, but also geopolitical superiority. In addition, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty stipulates that no celestial body, including the moon, can be under the sovereignty of any country, and that weapons of mass destruction cannot be placed there. 
However, technologies such as nuclear reactors are included in this law under the guise of peaceful purposes. In other words, we are moving forward in a gray area. And this could be a harbinger of future conflicts between countries over sovereignty in space. Ultimately, the answer to why we are returning to the moon is now very clear. Competition is back. It is no longer just about science. It is about strategic superiority, energy resources, and even a race to establish a military presence. Nuclear energy is one of the most powerful cards in this race. It is advancing quietly, but its impact will be significant. If these plans come to fruition, we will see the first nuclear power plant on the moon's surface within the next 10 years. Then perhaps fuel will be sent from the moon to Mars, or perhaps energy transfer experiments from there to Earth will begin. And this will usher in a new era in human history, the era of permanent life and competition in space. The moon, which still appears quiet and serene when you look up at the sky, is actually on the brink of a slow but very serious transformation. And this time, it's not just about getting there, it's about staying there and taking control. Which country do you think will build the first permanent base on the moon? And how do you think it will change global power dynamics? Share your thoughts in the comments. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to my channel. Until our next discovery, take care.